Bible tonight, if you will. I hope you have your Bible handy. If you don't, uh, why don't you get it right now? Let's turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Well, or I mean, not 14, John 21. Please turn to John 21. While you're turning to John 21, I want to ask you a question. Do you remember what happened on April 13th, 1997? Why, Tiger Woods won his first major title at the 61st U.S. Masters Tournament in Augusta, Georgia golf course. But you know what else happened? On April 13, 1997, Bethel Baptist Fellowship opened up for regular services. You know what happened, or what's going to happen, I should say, on June the 7th, 2020? Bethel Baptist Fellowship is going to reopen after being shut down since, let me see, Wednesday, March the 18th. So it's a big deal, and it ought to be a big occasion for praising the Lord together. I also wanted to say that uh, on Thursday evening, the Jewish celebration of Shavuos begins. And of course, that is a remembrance of God giving the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, and I guess it could be considered the birthday of Judaism. Do you remember what happened? as a result of the dancing and the cavorting around the golden calf, 3,000 died. But I should also mention the fact that this Sunday, many churches call it Pentecost Sunday because they are remembering the fact that the Spirit was given on Mount Zion on Shavuos. And you could say that according to Acts chapter 2 where this is all fulfilled, that that was the birthday of the church. And you remember what happened on that day? 3,000 were given life. There is no church without the Holy Spirit. As the law gives birth to Judaism, the Spirit births the church. But before we can reopen our church building for regular services again, perhaps we need a spiritual reopening, a reopening of our lives to the Holy Spirit of God. I've asked you to turn to John 21, and I want to, I want to take you to this passage because I see here a reopening of Peter's heart. A reopening of hearts, you might say. In the first six verses, we read the fact that uh, this is after Jesus has already showed himself following his resurrection two times to his disciples. That, of course, was in the upper room, and that's all recorded in John chapter 20. So this is a third time that Jesus shows himself to his disciples. In fact, we're told that in the 14th verse of John 21. But here they are, at least seven of what was left of the disciples, 11 now total, seven of them, and they're at the Sea of Galilee. You remember, Jesus told them, uh, go into Galilee and I'll meet you there. And so there are seven of them, and they're at the Sea of Galilee, and uh, what they are doing is uh, they're fishing. In fact, as we read... It says that uh, in verse 3, Simon Peter said unto them, that is the other six of the disciples, I go fishing. And they said, we also go with you. And so they went and they entered into a ship and they went fishing. And verse 3 says they, that night they caught nothing. And that's when you fished. You fished at night, the Sea of Galilee, and they caught absolutely nothing. But that is just the setting 
for the reopening of Peter's heart to the Lord. And that's what we really want to focus on tonight, reopening hearts. Have you possibly shut God out of your life in any way? And if so, you need to spiritually reopen your heart to him tonight. You know, even unbelievers, even people that aren't saved, need a reopening of their heart to the Lord. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean that there is no excuse for a heart that has come into this world with Jesus lighting that heart. The Bible says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all men. He is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And so people come into this world with the light of Jesus given to them. So my point is, they simply need to reopen their hearts to the Lord if they're not saved. There is a need for an unbeliever, a lost, an unsaved person to reopen their heart, and maybe that's you tonight. You must reopen your heart to the Lord. It's pictured, I think, in the parable that Jesus tells us in Luke 15 of a son, a young son, that uh, asked his father for his inheritance and then took that money and left home, ran away with the, with the money, and he wasted it just living it up. And when everything was gone and the man was now in poverty, he comes to his senses and he says, back home my father has servants and they have food to eat. They have clothes to wear. They have everything they need. And here I am, and I have nothing, and I'm starving. I'm going to go back to my father and just ask him to make me a servant. And the young man makes his way back home, and before he makes it all the way home, his father, who has obviously been looking for him, runs to meet him, welcomes him, gives him back everything and more than he had before he left. And Jesus uses that as a picture of someone who is welcomed by God when they reopen their heart to Jesus. And so if you're an unbeliever listening tonight, I want to challenge you. You've shut God out of your life. Reopen your heart to the Lord, and what you're going to find is that the Lord's been waiting for you all along, and he has arms that are ready to welcome you and to take you as his very own child. But you know, believers, believers sometimes need to reopen their hearts to the Lord as well. And we see this pictured in Peter. I think what happens in John chapter 21 is that Jesus is specially preparing Peter in particular for Shavuos, for that day of Pentecost that was just a few days ahead. He was going to prepare Peter for Shavuos and beyond as a result of reopening his heart to the Lord Jesus uh, on this occasion. And I want you to just think of Peter at this time. What I see in the first three verses of chapter 21 is a man that's, he's, he's really, he's discouraged. He denied the Lord three times. And I know that the Lord's already met with him and dealt with him, but he's a man that's discouraged. He's a man that's disappointed. I think that has something to do with the fact that he's gone back to fishing. There is some disappointment and discouragement on his part. And look at what happens in verses 4 and 5. They fished all night, verse 3 told us, and they didn't catch anything. In verse 4, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. And he calls to them from the shore while they're out in the boat. Early morning, verse 5, Jesus saith, Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. You know what he's doing? He's focusing their attention on their failure. Children, literally, boys, boys under training, boys in training, boys under my instruction. Do you have any meat? Do you have? That word meat is the only time 
that particular original word is used in the New Testament. And it's a compound Greek word that uh, means not only uh, something to eat, but uh, to bring something with what you have to eat. And I think what he's saying is, boys that I'm training, you don't even have a bite of fish to put together with the bread, do you? In other words, he's identifying them as total failures. And by the way, this was something that Peter, prior to, made his livelihood doing, fishing. And I believe that in order for us to have our heart reopened to the Lord, if he's been shut out in any way in your life as a believer, one of the ways in which he accomplishes that reopening is to identify the total failure in your life without him. Maybe you can point to something right now that comes to mind. Would you look at verse 6? He follows up that failure with fullness. He said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. Suddenly and greatly and supernaturally, they are successes. And I think this, again, foreshadows Shavuos. What's going to happen when on that day of Pentecost, Peter stands up and there's going to be 3,000 Jewish people and proselytes that at that moment are brought to faith in Jesus, the Messiah. It's God-empowered living and service that is really the results of opening, reopening your heart to the Lord. God empowers you. God enables you to do what you could never accomplish. He will take a failure and make it a spiritual success when you reopen your heart to the Lord. But I see in these verses and in this account not only a reopening of hearts, I see a reshaping of motives. Look at the seventh verse with me. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, and we know that is a code phrase for John, the disciple John, he said to Peter, it's the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt about his fisher's coat unto him, for he had taken it off, not that he was naked, but that he had taken his outer coat off. He put it back on, and he jumped into the Sea of Galilee. He jumped into the lake. It says he, he cast himself into the sea. The other disciples, they came in, in the little ship. They weren't very far from land, and they were dragging behind their ship the, the net full of fish. And as soon as they were come to land... They see Jesus already has a fire of coals and fish and bread cooking on it. And Jesus says in verse 10, bring of the fish which you've caught. And verse 11, guess who? Simon Peter went up and he drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153, for all, there were all so many, yet the net wasn't broken. What's going on here? This is what reopening the heart looks like. And what I see is a reshaping of a man's motives. First of all, I see Peter's eagerness here. He's eager for Jesus. He jumps into the water to rush to Jesus when he finds out that that's him on the shore. He's eager to get to Jesus. And when he gets to Jesus and Jesus says, bring the fish, he He's the one that steps up and he gives them all to the Lord. When God reopens a heart, he reshapes the motives in that heart. And the reshaping of the motives is that there is an eagerness in that person for Jesus like there never was before. There is a desire to get Jesus and to give all to Jesus. An eagerness for that and really... When it's all said and done, it's really not that the disciples caught a lot of fish. It's that Jesus caught Peter. 
There is a reshaping of his motives. There's an eagerness evident in this man's life now. And also a usefulness. In verse 8, uh, the, the fish that is uh, in the net, and then verse 11, him dragging that fish in. You see, to be useful to Jesus is always the result of being eager for Jesus. A total surrender is evident in obedience to the Lord. And when you're eager for the Lord, you're surrendered to him. You not only get Jesus, but you give all to Jesus. There's that total surrender, and as a result of that, obedience follows, and you become useful to the Lord. So there's a reshaping. When there's a reopening of the heart, there's a reshaping of the motives. There's an eagerness, and there's a usefulness. An eagerness for Jesus, and a usefulness to Jesus. There's one other thing that I want to mention tonight, the reopening of the hearts, the reshaping of the motive, and the refueling for service, the refueling of service. When the heart is reopened, when the motives are reshaped, that always leads to a refueling of our service for the Lord. Look at verse 12 and following. Jesus said to them, come and dine. Or verse... Uh, 15, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, or John, you love me more than these? You love me more than these other disciples? You said you did. You said they might forsake you, but I never will, but you denied me three times. So I'm going to ask you three times. You love me more than these? Could also mean not only that, but do you love me more than you love fishing? You love me more than you love these fish? He's refueling service in his disciple Peter. And uh, he is demanding love. Jesus is being very loving, and he feeds them in love. Bread and fish that he has prepared on the, the fire. But now in verses 15 to 17, he is challenging Peter to feed lovingly. He says, Peter, you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed then lovingly feed my lambs. That is, new converts. He said to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. Feed my sheep. Actually, the word feed there means tend, care for. Like a shepherd has not only the responsibility to see that his sheep get food, but that all of their needs are met. Do it lovingly. So it's a loving, loving. The basis for ministry is love. He says it again. In that 17th verse, the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He says, feed my sheep. That is, lovingly feed the mature believers as well as the lambs, the young, the immature ones. Love the basis for all ministry. Paul says it this way, it's the love of Christ that constrains me. It's the love of Christ that compels me. Lovingly feed, trusting Jesus to meet all your need that you might be enabled then to meet the needs of others. To lovingly feed. And then in verses 18 to 22, to follow. Look at what he says here a couple of times in these verses. Uh, then Jesus talks about Peter one day following him even to the death, not denying him this time, but following him even to the death. And in verse 18, this spake he by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, to Peter, follow me. Peter turns around and he sees John following 
And uh, he says, Lord, uh, what about him? <laughs> What's John going to do? Jesus, verse 22, says, that's not important. What's important is that you follow me. Refueling his service. Having reopened his heart, reshaped his motives, he's refueling his service by calling him to feed lovingly and to follow lowly. Jesus himself said, I have not come to be served, but I have come to serve and to give up myself, to give up myself, to give myself a ransom for many. And that is the model. When Jesus says, follow me, that's, what's he, that's what he's calling us to. He's calling us to do what he did. He's calling us to give up our lives. He's calling us to deny ourselves, to die to our selfish desires, to our own plans, to our own way, to lowly, humbly follow him, to come to serve rather than to be served by others, to a life of selflessness, of sacrifice for the Lord, for others, to, to deny ourselves. So Peter reopened his heart to Jesus, and, uh, and he began at Shavuos, and uh, really to be used not only then but beyond that, to open, to open, and to build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not ready for Bethel Baptist Fellowship to reopen their building for regular service again until you have reopened your heart to your need of him, your need of him for cleansing, your need of him for empowering you. Don't crowd Jesus out of your heart. Reopen. Reopen yourself. Reopen up to the Lord. I read about a, well, I guess he was a, a songwriter. His name was Daniel Whittle. And uh, he rose to the rank of a major in the American Civil War. And Daniel was missing an arm as a result of combat. And while he was a prisoner of war, and was recovering from his wounds, he was looking for something to read, and he found a New Testament. And, and although he was under conviction from reading the New Testament, he still was reluctant to receive Christ into his heart. And a short time later, an orderly in the prison camp approached him and asked him, if he would pray with a dying prisoner because the prisoner had seen him reading his Bible and figured he must know Jesus, and so he wanted him to pray with him. And so before going to pray earnestly with that young dying soldier, he got right with the Lord and he got saved and invited Jesus into his own heart. And later on in his own words he said, and I quote, I cannot but believe that God who used him to bring me to the Savior used me to lead him to trust Christ's precious blood and find a pardon. I hope to meet him in heaven, unquote. What a wonderful miracle of two lives that are transformed really in one fell swoop. Later, Daniel Whittle, Whittle wrote a song by adapting the words of an anonymous poem. And I want to read the words to that poem to you. And here they are. Have you any room for Jesus, he who bore your load of sin? As he knocks and asks admission, sinners, will you let him in? Room for Jesus, King of glory? Hasten now his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open. Bid him enter while you may. Room for pleasure, room for business, but for Christ the crucified, not a place that he can enter in the heart for which he died. Room for Jesus, king of glory. Hasten now his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open. 
bid him enter while you may. Have you any room for Jesus as in grace he calls again? Oh, today is time accepted. Tomorrow you may call in vain. Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open. Bid him enter while you may. Room and time now give to Jesus. Soon will pass God's day of grace. Soon the heart left cold and silent and the Savior's pleading cease. Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open. Bid him enter while you may. Jesus is pictured in Scripture as knocking at the door. He's knocking at the door of your heart tonight. And he wants you to open that door if you never have before. Or perhaps he's knocking and he's asking you to reopen the door of your heart and let him in. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening that you are a God that doesn't give up on your people. We thank you for how you recommissioned Peter, how you enabled him to reopen his heart and reshaped his motives and refueled him for service. Lord, you want to do that in each life that is tuned in to this message tonight. And I pray that we would listen to you and let you have your way. And as Whittle's song says, that we would swing the doors of our heart wide open to you and invite you in while we can. I pray, Lord, that you would do a great reopening in us before we reopen the doors of this church building. Reopen us, we pray, in Jesus' name.